Okay, I think we'll, I think we'll start now and um, obviously people can join um, into the webinar as, as we go. Um, thank you so much everyone for um, attending. I think it's going to be a really, really interesting um, session. We've got some fantastic um, speakers lined up. Um, so what we'll be exploring today is justice for crash victims, how to get it and also how, how it affects people when um, justice, justice doesn't happen. Um, my name is Vicky Lebrecht and I manage the um, campaigns and policy and media for Road Peace. I'm a crash victim myself. I was run over by a lorry in 2014 and, and lost my leg and then became involved with Road Peace um, after that. Um, I had a, a good experience of the justice system all in all. I came away uh, feeling, um, feeling pleased with, with how I was treated. Um, the driver who, who ran me over um, ended up getting just six points off his license and a £750 fine, but the justice system generally in the way I was treated by the police and the CPS was, was good. Um, justice has always been something that's extremely important for road peace. Um, you know, it, it will never bring a loved one back to get justice, um, but it's still incredibly important for families and also the lessons are learned when the justice system treats people properly. Um, so that, that's why it's so important. And the other thing, the other thing as well, and, and what we're thinking about this National Road Victim Month is also in terms of the sheer number of people that are affected um, by crashes. I'm just gonna start sharing my screen now. Um, in 1896, uh, Bridget Driscoll became the first person to be killed by a motor vehicle in Britain. Um, when that happened, the coroner said that such a thing should never happen again. And here we are 124, 124 years later, and there's been well over half a million people that have been killed on the roads in Britain. And 1.35 million people are killed annually worldwide. So it's also the sheer number of people that are affected. Um, in terms of how justice impacts them as well. So I'll quickly tell you about um, our speakers today. So we have, first up, we've got Rad Seeger, who's the spokesperson and, and advisor for Harry Dunn's family. Um, in his session, he'll be covering off the fight for justice for Harry and the power of advocacy. I'm sure most of you are aware of Harry Dunn's case. Uh, following that, we have got Joyce, Craig and Doug, who are Road Peace members. Um, Craig was uh, intentionally crushed by a car. Um, and we'll exp be exploring with, with them why does using a vehicle with intent to preclude attempted murder. We also have a pre-record from Claire Waxman, who's the London Victims Commissioner. So she will be talking about the Victims Code and the Victims Law. And uh, finally, we have Kira Lee, who's a Road Peace member, and she'll be discussing with me about Theresa May's new bill, which is um, introducing a maximum life sentence for death by dangerous driving and how that will impact on families. So we'll be starting um, with Rad then. Um, I think this session will be incredibly, incredibly useful to victims and also for people who are fighting for justice at the moment. Um, this is just a kind of the, the briefest, you know, it's really the tip of the iceberg really in terms of uh, the media coverage that um, Harry Dunn's case got. Um, and so I'm really excited to have um, Rad with us today. I'm just going to stop screen sharing now so he can tell us more about, um, about the fight for justice. So Rad, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself quickly before we, before we start. Uh, Vicky, uh, good afternoon and good afternoon to everybody. It's, a, it's an absolute honor and pleasure to be with you today. Just before I start, I, I know there are a lot of people on, on this call, you know, including you, <coughs> who have you know, suffered terribly as a result of um, other, um, other drivers' actions on the roads, and my heart breaks for every single one of you. Um, last August, the 27th, um, Harry Dunn's parents got the news that nobody wants, that awful phone call, that awful knock on the door, um, to say that Harry had been involved in a serious crash. And, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, three or four hours uh, later, he was pronounced dead in hospital. So that, you know, that was the first violent um, moment 
that they had. About a month later, about two weeks after the funeral, they, they, they suffered the next violent moment, um, which absolutely devastated them on top of their loss, which is when they were told by the police that they had less than 1% chance of having anyone held accountable because um, the person who took Harry's life had gone. And that was um, a terrible day for them as well. So I'm a neighbor of uh, the family and mm -hmm. I've known Harry since he was two years old. And I kept my distance obviously for the first few weeks to just give the family the opportunity to come to terms with what happened. But my children were very good friends with Harry as well. And they started nagging me to go up to see them because there was a problem. And I walked in um, two days um, after they'd been told that news to a scene of utter devastation. The family were, I, I, I can't begin to tell you, um, they were all over the place. And uh, I guess I just did what any good neighbor would do. I, you know, they told me the problem. They told me that the police had told them that there was just no chance of justice. And, you know, forget the fact that I'm a lawyer. I think mm -hmm. we all understand that you do not get to kill somebody in the UK and walk away, even if you are a diplomat. But the trouble is they felt completely abandoned by the system. And I don't mean any of the individuals. The individuals are all terrific people. Many of them are my friends. You know, the family liaison officers, the investigative police officers, you know, the, the prosecutors in the CPS, they're all terrific people. But the family felt utterly abandoned um, that day. It took me about three hours. I came back home. I did a bit of research. And I found out that Anne Sekoulis did not have diplomatic immunity. Um, they called a family meeting the next day, and about 45 people came to that. Uh, the, the family liaison officer was there, um, and I basically shoved him out of the way, and I stood up in front of the family, and I told them that Anne Sekoulis would absolutely be coming back and that they would get justice. So in brief, Vicky, that's the story. Um, <laughs> two weeks later, um, I, well, I, just, to, just to move it on a bit, you know, we didn't want any of this publicity. I then started to engage with the family liaison officers, tried to engage with the Crown Prosecution Service, with the Foreign Office, nobody would talk to me. And I just happened to be well connected in the media and I gave um, the authorities a deadline, uh, which they did not comply with, to come and talk to us to resolve this. We hit the nuclear button and two weeks later, we were in the Oval Office confronting President Trump. So I hope that gives everybody a bit of background. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And I, it's just, the case is just, there's so many like twists and turns and so many different things um, have happened. Like what, like what are the key milestones in the, in the case, do you think? Well, what's interesting to think about, of course, is um, we had to, you know, fight to get all you wonderful people on our side, the great British public. And once we did that and you guys started clamoring for justice, um, we, you know, fast forward you know, three or four months to December, and it took a lot of effort, but mm. the Crown Prosecution Service did charge her with causing death by dangerous driving, which obviously was a, a, a massive moment for the family. Um, having been told three or four months earlier that it was never going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. we, you know, we talk about not climbing mountains in our campaign, but shifting mountains, and that was the very first mountain that we just muscled out of the way. Obviously, um, the, the authorities then went on to seek her extradition, which we are still fighting for. But then um, in May, um, Interpol circulated a red notice requiring every single police force to track her down, arrest her and re return her to the United Kingdom. So look, I mean, I, you know, I cannot begin to tell you how proud I am of this family because it would have been so easy for them to just accept what was said. And mm. I suppose in some small way, I'm partly responsible for turning that around for them, but they are the heroes because they decided to not take this lying down. And this is just, I mean, this case just goes to show how important it is to have someone advocating on your behalf, right? Um, and I guess for you, like, what, what's, been your, what's been your biggest challenge and what's been your biggest frustration like throughout, throughout this process? 
Well, what, what's absolutely heartbreaking for me is that I, you know, this required my involvement in the first place. I had just yeah. assumed that the police and the foreign office were going to scoop these people up and help them in their darkest hour. And, and Vicky, it was the exact opposite. Yeah. Now, you know, it, 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 in our case, I was horrified to see that people, you know, were really unfamiliar with the victim's code. Yeah. When, I, when I announced myself as the spokesperson, and for those who don't know, under the victim's code, you, you know, the families are entitled to appoint a spokesperson. As soon as I declared that that's who I was, it was like I was a leper. People didn't want me around. When we went to the foreign office for the first meeting with the foreign secretary, you know, he, he asked me to stay out of the room. He was unfamiliar with um, the victim's code. So my, mm. my biggest issue is that I needed to do any of this. And it breaks my heart that we have had to put this family through this ordeal of this campaign to just get that little bit of justice. And again, just also to remind you, for anybody who thinks that you know, this is about vengeance or retribution, it just isn't. Um, Harry Dunn was a very principled young man, 19 years old, who believed in right versus wrong. His mm. mother missed him at the hospital by two or three minutes. He died, sadly, uh, before she arrived. But she stood over him and said, I, I will get you justice. So those are the drivers. But I just wish I, 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 wish I had, it, um, had to become involved. And I think the fact that I had to become involved shows that although we have terrific people in the police and the CPS, you know, there is, there is a real problem with this system. And I think, uh, you know, I have been approached by hundreds and hundreds of people since starting this campaign who sadly have suffered, a, a, you know, a similar sort of feeling of injustice. Mm. Uh, thank you for, for explaining that. And I, um, how has the fight, like, how has the injustice um, impacted Harry's family? Because obviously the worst thing ever has happened, that your son's being killed. And then you're having to then fight the system as well. How has that impacted them? Yeah, so again, I think for me primarily, and I, I think every family will be different, but, but my ultimate priority, because these are my friends, was to just, you know, having lost Harry, was just to try and help them, you know, preserve th their mental health as best they could. And I know from my background and from previous work that if you don't get justice and you don't get closure, it absolutely consumes you. That anger, that frustration consumes you for years and years. So I was determined to at least get us to a point where they, they would get that justice. But I think, and if, if, if they were on, on this today, they would say to you that this campaign has absolutely saved their lives because if they didn't have this, this campaign to wake up to fight every day for Harry, they probably would have not had the sort of structure in their day as they came to terms with their loss. And many of them, I fear, would have, would have gone off the edge of a cliff. So anybody on this call who thinks that it's okay to say to anybody, I'm sorry, you're not going to get justice, that is not acceptable in our system, our rules-based system. That doesn't mean you're ultimately going to get justice, but we all have to have confidence in the system and it has to be fair. And I know that there are many people involved in the Harry Dunn case in authority who have learned an enormous amount from Harry's family through their campaign, and I'm sure would, would do things differently going forward. So for me, Vicky, it's all about mental health. It's not about mm -hmm. how, how long Ansar Coolis might go away for if she's convicted. It's just about Harry's life mattered. And we live in a rules-based system where if things go wrong and they inevitably do, we are all entitled to look to that system and just to give us that justice. Otherwise, our lives are meaningless. Thank you. Yes, that's so true. And I, I should just say quickly as well to um, the people that are on the webinar, if you've got questions for Rad, you can type them into the Q&A box. There should be a Q&A uh, thing at the bottom of your screen. So you can type in questions and then I'll be asking Rad the questions once we've finished um, doing our session now, okay? Um, and I guess, you know, something that, that struck me so much, Rad, is about the massive media coverage that you've managed, managed to get off the back of this case. Like how, how have you done that? So I knew right from the start I mean, yeah, the, the authorities were so intent on sweeping this case under the carpet, and I've, got, I've seen all the evidence around that. They were 
doing their best to kick this family off into the long grass that the only way I was going to get that turned around. And you can imagine the might and the power of two governments. If you were taking on one government, that would be bad enough, but taking on two, I couldn't do it on my own. And we, you know, we could sit and shout from the rooftops about our injustice. But the absolute priority was to get you all fired up and get you all as angry as I was. And the only way to do that in this country is through the press. And I just happened to have one of my best friends who worked for Sky News, Lisa Dowd, who's a fantastic reporter. And I called her and I told her the story. And she came down the next day, interviewed the parents and broke, broke the story the next day. And we absolutely, we weren't sure whether you guys were going to be interested in us. We didn't know whether it was even going mm. to be a local newspaper. But from the moment that that story broke, then everybody else started to pile in all around the world. I mean, we were all horrified that the UK's greatest ally, the United States, would inflict this terrible abuse of human rights on just decent, wonderful people. And just so that you know, you know, Harry's dad, Tim, is, is head of maintenance at a school and mom, um, until recently, worked at a GP surgery. They are just mm -hmm. normal UK citizens. And, you know, listen, I think I think just if we're if we're looking for lessons learned and how you all might take your fight for justice forward, Engaging with the media is a key part of that. And I will always defend the free press now um, because without them, we would have been nowhere. And they are an absolute cornerstone of our free democracy. And um, without, without them, that none of this would have happened. And what's it been like for you, Rad, as someone, you know, you didn't know that it was going to explode like this. And um, obviously your background is a lawyer, your neighbours uh, with Harry Dunn's family, um, you know, and now spokesperson and, you know, in the Oval Office and all of these things. Like, what's that been like? I mean, life changing, as you all can imagine. Uh, you know, I think I'd been to the uh, White House once when I was 13 on one of the tours. Hmm. But I, I had enjoyed my anonymity and helping people in various ways in the background. This was a, a truly, you know, shocking um, thing to become involved in but you know when you when, when I look at um, Harry's parents and I see the suffering that they're going through um, I, I, I knew that I was doing the right thing and I've always had that as one of my 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 principles of you know just do the right thing and they look to me as you know somebody who could help them and once you start and then you see the suffering um, I, I, I I just decided to throw myself into it. And I'm just one of those people who always, when I was young, if somebody was being beaten up in the playground, I would go and help. Um, I would just, you know, I, and I've got no fear. I don't care who you are. If you're standing in the way of injustice, which I absolutely hate, and it's affecting people close to me, you're either going to work with me or I'll sweep you out of the way. And we have managed to you know, really be very powerful and forceful in our messaging, which I think is important because, you know, these are powerful people opposite us. It's not easy mm -hmm. to talk to President Trump and tell him, uh-uh, this isn't going to happen. Um, and it was really scary. But when you're involved in something like that, you, um, you, you know you're doing the right thing. It's then about having energy. <laughs> Sleep <Yes>. is... <laughs> <laughs> but listen, these people, these people um, are good people and they need, they need people like me to help them through. And I will not stop until justice has been delivered. That's um, amazing. So there's lots of questions coming in through uh, the, the, the chat box now. Um, I think just I'll, I'll ask you one more and then we'll, we'll, I'll start reading out the ones from the audience. So yeah, there's people listening right now who've recently lost a loved one and feel like they're facing injustice, what advice can you give them? Gosh, I think the, I think, I think the most important thing as you're going, you know, if, if it's recent, obviously you're still in shock and grief. Um, what does justice mean? You know, what, it might mean something to you, but it might mean something different to me. And I think families, don't let people like me come in and impose a, what I believe is justice. I think families need to think very carefully before they embark on Everything. Obviously, they're coping with the loss, but you know our system doesn't always deliver justice. You know, you know, but we, you know, you have to think about what you want, and if you choose not to walk on by, um, even if the authorities are are encouraging you to do that, 
then find yourself a family spokesperson. I mean, it can be a family member. It doesn't need to be somebody like me. Um, and just don't take just don't take no for an answer. I think that's our biggest lesson is, you know, but I think as a, you know, as a community of people, and we're all serving these victims of r road crashes in different ways. I think we all need to come together and do better for them. The system is still letting people down. I, and I think we need to think carefully about where we signpost people to. It isn't always a solicitor. It isn't always somebody in the media. And every case will be different. But I would encourage people to, to pursue justice because I, I believe it's important for closure. Um, but how you go about it, I think it's still something that we, we need to work about you know, we need to think about. It just so happens that, you know, Harry's parents had me living about 300 yards down the road and I was free and available. I don't know how many other people could have done this or are willing mm. to do it, but I, you know, I, I think signposting people in the right direction is going to be critical going forward. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so yeah, so lots of questions coming in. So um, Kate has asked, um, how confident are you of justice being done? Will she be extradited? As an American living in, Lo American living in London, I found this story especially appalling, a complete disgrace. Really impress impressed by your campaigning work. Thank you so much, Kato. That's much appreciated. 100% Anne Sekoulis will be facing the English justice system. I'm the sort of person that I would not have started this campaign if I didn't know where, you know, where it would end. And Although we're almost a year on and it's taking a long time, you know, people will tell you that sometimes these campaigns take years, years and years. Um, there is no doubt in our minds that we will get justice. And uh, I, I personally believe we're not very far away. There's lots going on behind the scenes, um, as you might imagine, diplomatically. Um, so we are extreme, 100 percent confident. Mm. And what does so a couple of people have asked this in the chat. So. What does justice look like for Harry Dunn's family? What are they looking to achieve? Yeah, thank you. That's a really important question. Um, you know, these are terrific parents who bear Ansicoulis no ill will. They do not hate her. They obviously hate what she did. And mm. she's the mother of three. For, for the parents and Harry, justice in this case means Ansicoulis simply presenting herself to the English justice system. What happens after that is not a matter for us as victims of a crime. We have to give that to the authorities and trust the system. If she's acquitted, there's nothing we can do about it. If she's convicted and uh, doesn't get a very long um, sentence for the dangerous driving, again, we just, we, we have to let go of that. So justice for us simply means doing what you and I would have to do, Vicky, which is not walking away after we um, took somebody's life and just going through the system. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think, yeah, that is a, that's really good. That's good to hear. Um, so there's a couple of questions. So, um, an anonymous attendee has said that her mother was killed by a lady who accelerated for no reason with no other car involved. We may never know why that happened. Is that acceptable? Justice for me, for me is knowing why it happened. And I think that just goes to show, right, that there's different, like justice covers a lot of different things, doesn't it? It does. And I, you know, speaking as a lawyer, I, you know, I, uh, I'm always very clear with people that you're not always going to get the justice that you feel you deserve. That is not what our system is there to do. So for instance, and there are many terrible cases that I've come across where there is just no evidence or not enough evidence, or there isn't the CCTV or dash cam footage. And you know, we all know our system does allow people to escape. And I think, uh, you know, I'm always very clear when I sit down with people from the beginning is, you know, uh, you know, you will not always get the justice that you want. And I, I wonder as a society, you know, what we can do to improve that situation, either in terms of delivering better justice or actually educating people about, you know, what the justice system really does. And, you know, for instance, we've seen recently and the other family I'm looking after at the moment, um, PC Andrew Harper's family, did not feel that they got justice after a long trial. Mm. I had to say to them, look, that is it. You know, the, you know, the justice system delivered the best possible justice it could. You know, if, if we're not happy with it, it's no good complaining about it in my view. We all have to get up off our rear ends and change the law. And that's for us to do as voters. And 
to campaign for um, justice. I think we need to do a lot better. We cannot have these terrible events happening and people walking away not having confidence in the system. That's, uh, for me, it's all about confidence in the system. Brad, thank you so much for that. And thank you for everyone that's put in um, some questions. We haven't got enough, we've got a very tight schedule uh, to stick to, so I haven't got quite enough time to, um, to answer um, all of the questions that are in the chat box. However, I will be um, keeping a note of them. And um, after the uh, webinar, um, we will get any questions um, answered later by, by email. So Rad, thank you so much. I feel very lucky to have um, had you here chatting to us today. And I think everything that you've achieved is incredible. Um, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen again now because we've got a message of support from um, Harry Dunn's mum. One moment, please. Hi all, I'm Charlotte Charles, Harry Dunn's mum. I'd like to start by firstly thanking everybody for their support. Um, without it, there are some days that there's no way we would have got through. I also need to say a huge thank you to Rad Seeger. He's been our advocate and our family friend and our spokesperson. Without an advocate like Rad, there's absolutely no way that we would be as far along in our ruling campaign as we are now today. I just need to urge anybody out there that feels that they've suffered an injustice to just be strong, stand up for your rights, continue to fight. Your loved one was extremely important. Just keep going. Um, you'll get the results that you need in the end. Take care. Hi all. Okay, so now we are moving on to um, our next session, uh, which is with Joyce and Doug. Um, and this is all focused on um, why does using a vehicle with intent preclude attempted murder? Because that is what happened in Craig's case. I'm going to do a very brief summary because it's quite complicated. Um, and I think it'd be good to just do a, a very brief overview before we go into um, the, the, the session with um, Joyce and Doug. So on the 14th of June 2018, Craig um, was crushed by a car intentionally whilst he was cycling. Um, you know, very, very near death. Um, and throughout this whole time period, um, he's, he has very um, uh, extensive uh, operations and also rehabilitation. But following... Um, the assault, not the crash, it's an assault in this case. Attempted murder was on the table. Um, following that, the police then go with the slightly lesser charge of grievous bodily harm. Um, and then on the trial that happens on the 2nd of September and it only lasts three days instead of 10, uh, the CPS essentially just slip in an additional charge of causing serious injury by dangerous driving, which is lesser than grievous bodily harm. And then on the 4th of September, the driver is convicted of causing serious injury by dangerous driving. Um, I've got a message. Okay, Craig. I've got a um, video that I'm going to play now that we did a pre-record with Craig um, uh, uh, yesterday. Um, so we'll play that. And then after that, we'll do the um, session with Doug and Joyce. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. It's very much appreciated. Um, can you tell us a bit about what happened that day? Um, I travelled to Epsom uh, from Streatham on the morning mm -hmm. to do some gardening work in Joyce's garden. And uh, the plan was to leave on the afternoon, which I did approximately three-ish, to go and get the train, put my bike on the train. And um, got to uh, your east and got the train to Mitchum Fields, got off the bike, Mitchum Fields and cycled the rest of the way home. Um, I went via Tooting 
at Tube Station, Stapleton Road, and was traveling down that road, and just on that road on the left, as you were coming to the first junction onto one way street, so then whoever comes up that road has to stop. And I was looking up my peripheral at this car traveling at speed coming up this road, and I felt, is this guy gonna stop? And I was correct, he didn't. So I, I took evasive action and swerved so he couldn't hit me. And that's what happened. But at that point, I got off my bike and put my bike in front of his car to stop him from driving away because it looked like he was going to drive away. Mm. And I remonstrated about the giveaway line. You didn't stop at the, the gives a giveaway line. I was shouting very angrily. And he's just looking at me. Um, then what happened next? Um, well, the car started to move towards me. And at first I just thought he was just trying to frighten me, a bluff. Mm. And then all of a sudden the car speeded up, which then I didn't have time to get out of the way. I'm shouting, help, he's trying to kill me. I then got rammed with his car into my body, everything caved in, my ribs, everything, I felt everything go and I got dragged along. And I knew that I couldn't take the pain and I remember just going limp. And the next thing I know, I, I, I was on the, well, I, I must have come at the end of the car and got released between, there was a parked car behind. And so the, the, the two cars, metal to metal, never touched, it was just a case of my body taking everything until I got released. At that point, I come back round and the next thing I know there was ambulance. I was having trouble breathing and in such pain I asked the ladies, ambulance uh, lady for morphine, to give me morphine. Uh, that, that's essentially what happened. Oh, Craig, I'm so sorry. Such, I mean, it's, it's obviously tough to talk about, isn't it? Because, you know, just it's one thing being, you know, in, in the crash, but to remember someone doing it intentionally to you, I think is very, very traumatizing. So what has your recovery been like? I am still in recovery after two years plus and have life changing injuries which are daily reminders. I spent 17 weeks in three different hospitals, St. George's, St. Thomas's, and finally Douglas Bader Rehabilitation, where I learned to walk again. Mm. Recovery is hard and it's difficult to motivate myself as I have severe PTSD, anxiety, and low mood, but somehow, I keep going as I want to get my body to the best I can, despite my permanent injuries and chronic pain. Oh, Craig, kudos to you um, for all that, because I know it's not easy, um, you know, in terms of rehabilitation. It's a, a lot of work. It's particularly, you know, given your injuries, because you, you, it's a miracle, really, that you're here chatting to us today, isn't it? Well, it really is. I mean, on several counts, Apparently, I find out all this information later, but the lady, ambulance lady at the scene, had to give me an injection, I believe, into the heart mm. to, to bring me back to earth. And then on the operating table, and then after six days, I was failing. And that's when I got put on the ECMO machine. Um, mm. Yeah, I'm so sorry, but, Craig, but um, your, yeah, your recovery is really amazing, given everything. Craig, um, what impact has the justice process had on you? I do not feel I got justice for what happened to me. And I still believe the man was trying to kill me and feel the charge should have been attempted murder. Yeah. But was told intent was difficult to prove and there was solid evidence and a strong case for GBH with intent section 18. During the trial, I felt I was treated as if I was guilty. I wasn't given enough 
time to read my statement, mm -hmm. which was taken over a year before the trial. And I was constantly told I didn't need to attend the court after I give evidence. I could leave after I give my evidence. The barrister hardly spoke to me mm. or li listened to me or even tried to answer my few questions. I felt invisible, worthless, and the outcome and the conviction of the lesser charge, which was slipped in, which I struck, we had no idea about, has impact impacted on me negatively on my health, health, mental health. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Craig. I think, um, I know what you've been through, just the most awful, most traumatic thing in itself, but then to be treated that way by the justice system just makes things even worse, doesn't it? Um, it does, it does. It's no, no question in my mind mm. that just, justice wasn't served in any way, shape or form. Um, thank you so much to Craig for um, sharing sharing that with us. I think it just really goes to show, you know, the the impact that that, that I mean, firstly the physical impacts. I mean, his photos of Craig in intensive care and then learning to walk again, the physical impact, but also how upsetting and re-traumatizing it is. Um, to not feel like justice was served and to, and, and to be treated badly by the system. So, oops, that one. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing now and um, we will now be joined by Doug and Joyce, who, uh, Doug, you must unmute yourself quickly. Uh, Joyce has just done so. Um, thank you so much um, for joining us, um, Doug and Joyce, it's really appreciated. Thank you for having us. That's okay. Doug, I think you're still muted. What I'll do is I'll... Um... There we go. Oh, there you go. See that? Perfect. I can hear you now. Great. Thank you. Um, great. So, okay. So, Joyce, you're, you're, you're Craig's partner. So, you've been through, through him with all of this from, from the beginning. And, Doug, you are a friend of, of Joyce and Craig's um, and journalist by trade and, and used to produce um, quite much, as I understand it. Um, you know, the evidence, from what I can see, the evidence was there and the police seemed really clear that this was intentional. Why was it not attempted murder, in your opinion? Um, I think what happened was when the police came to see me, uh, we didn't know at the time if um, Craig would survive. So they um, initially described what the charges may be on the information that they had present. And that was, if he died, it could be murder, or if he survived, it could be attempted uh, murder. We later on uh, received information from the family liaison officer when Craig was still in a coma to say that four witnesses had uh, um, said that it looked like intentional and that they definitely had enough um, evidence for a charge of GBH. Mm. When he was able to talk, uh, one of the first things that he said frequently was that man tried to kill me. He drove his car deliberately at me. Uh, then when Craig gave his evidence after he'd learned how to talk again, um, gave the evidence the 11th of July and we thought after that, that um, him giving his evidence that it would be uh, a charge of attempted murder. But uh, when it came back, uh, the police told us, um, so that was the July and then we had to wait until the February until such times we heard about the charge, which was an email uh, said the charge, uh, the charge is GBH with intent. Uh, when we questioned it, we were told that uh, to prove attempted murder uh, and to prove intent was very difficult. Therefore, they had gone for GBH as they felt they had um, a solid 
a solid case. So we asked if that could be reviewed and we never heard anything about it. And then when we went to court, at that time we had accepted the uh, GBH and that's what we expected. Mm. Okay. Um, and what was the, like, what was that, and what was the investigation process like for you, Joyce? Did you feel kind of supported and informed by the police or how did you, how was the, the, this, the, the process to get to getting to court? I think that initially when they thought Craig was going to die and we had the family liaison officer, uh, we met with her just over about 27 hours later after the assault and she outlined all the support um, that uh, she would give, uh, outlined what was going to happen. Uh, she also questioned us about uh, what we thought Craig might have said. So it was like a two-way process of us actually having to answer questions about Craig. Mm. All of a sudden, um, she just disappeared. Um, Actually, we were over the moon uh, that Craig uh, had survived. We knew that that's going to be a long uh, recovery period of up to like three to five years. Uh, he's going to have permanent injuries, but everything just went cold. And then we started uh, emailing the police. Uh, we asked the police uh, questions. We were told by the officer in charge that he wasn't uh, co-investigating with us. Uh, we knew that. We just wanted regular updates and uh, we also wanted information that he could share. So the police uh, were very unhelpful and didn't communicate uh, very much at all. Mm. I'm sorry to hear that. I think that's um, yeah, sort of difficult. Um, and so, okay, so, so, the, the, so once you got to court, so Joyce and, and Doug, what was that experience like for you? Like, what, what, what were you left with thinking about the court experience? Well, it, it's, as you said, I mean, I ran Crime Watch for a, a couple of years. Uh, so I, police and uh, lawyers have, uh, have, have been um, very common in my life and courtrooms, mm -hmm. uh, been in hundreds of them. I've never encountered anything like this because... Uh, as Rad was saying earlier, I mean, this is totally different because everything that didn't happen in poor Harry's case has happened here. We got the guy in court. Um, but then when you get to court, expectation is a big thing. And again, as Rad says, you cannot guarantee what a jury will decide, but you can try to put the best evidence available in front of them. This didn't happen. And you can, for, for the Crown Prosecution Service's own best efforts to be worth the time they spend on a case, you want the best witness available to you in a courtroom. And yet they gave no time uh, to Craig to help him say his piece which he did brilliantly but it wasn't any thanks to them and they uh, despite requests for a meeting with his barrister that didn't happen now when when i saw in court now this is not an ageist thing said a guy who's touching 70 <laughs> but but the barrister um had probably seen better days but he did not make any effort at all to communicate and, and so having had a terrible thing happen, and although the story is complicated in one way, it's dead simple in another. Craig's on a bike on a road, a guy comes out, Craig tries to avoid the bloke who might have killed him first time round. The guy stops, he gets the bike in front of him, he gives the guy a mouthful, what are you doing? There's a giveaway there, for God's sake. The guy just sits there and eventually drives a car through him. Now, this is an automatic car. It's not as if your foot slips off the clutch. He has had to put his foot on the accelerator and sandwich Craig between a parked car and his SUV. Now, when somebody does that, that is an intentional act. This guy did not leave 
the mosque that morning intending to do this. And I think intent is a, is a big issue in these cases, but there was intent at the end. I mean, somebody who reaches into a kitchen drawer and stabs somebody with a knife may not have planned that before they sat down for a romantic dinner, but it's what happened and there is still intent involved. If you put your foot on the accelerator of a car and drive it through somebody, that is minimum um, grievous bodily harm with intent. Um, the failure to prove it, we can slightly park. What is appalling about the case and what other lawyers need to bear in mind for the future is that for Craig and Joyce to arrive at court with no knowledge that this additional charge had been slipped in, and when you look at the legal provisions under the victim's code, and we hope the law will be changed here, if, if you add, if you put in a, a replacement charge, you have to tell somebody like Craig, you have to tell the victim. If you merely add a charge, you don't have to do anything. So two people arrived in court thinking that somebody might be charged with a significant offense and because of various other failures in the system, um, you know, a guy ends up with probably doing 15 months showing no remorse uh, and um, the whole thing was was like a folly. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the things that, yes, strikes me so much of it. And I wondered with your experience with um, Crime Watch, um, if, you, if this wasn't a car that had been used as a, as a weapon, if it was a kitchen knife or whatever yeah. it was, um, obviously then a, the lower charge of causing serious injury by dangerous driving wouldn't exist. Do you think, um, yeah, would there be an alternative charge if it wasn't the car that was being used as a weapon? No, that's, I mean, look, what would you rather face? I mean, if somebody came at you with a, you know, unpleasantly with a bottle or a knife or a club mm -hmm. or something, you know, you, it's not something you'd want on yourself, but I'd, I'd probably risk any of those than a two-ton motor vehicle. Mm. And, and when, when somebody puts the foot in the accelerator like that, you are in effect pressing a trigger. So why it got reduced from attempted murder, you know, is, is difficult in its own right. But you can make a case for doing that. You can make mm -hmm. a case for doing that if you go whole hog on GBH. I think the problem in the system may well be that in their desire to actually ensure that they get something with conviction marked on it, they go for a lower charge so that the conviction rate stays up. This case, if it had not had the additional dangerous driving charge, the jury, there is no way the jury would have avoided um, uh, convicting on GBH. They didn't because of all kinds of reasons uh, that were caused by putting in an additional charge that the victim and his partner knew nothing about. Thank you. Thank you for that, Doug. And, um... Joyce, like what has the impact, what has the verdict, what has the, um, what impact has the verdict had on, on you? We heard from Craig, but how has it impacted you? Well, I think that um, I used to always be a strong believer, uh, and I've worked in the criminal justice system as a youth worker, and always believed that we did get justice. Uh, going through this whole system, uh, we were treated like second-class um, citizens. So I've lost all faith in the criminal justice uh, system. And I think that for both of us, the, the lesser charge and not knowing about it, we were unprepared. This is negatively impacted on Craig's mental health. And as I'm his main carer, then I have to support him with his PTSD anxiety and low mood and that is very very difficult mm. and I think yeah. if he had had the ABH you don't know it may have been different. Mm. Thank you um, also I will encourage um, attendees if to, to type in if you've got any questions for Doug and Joyce do type them into the Q&A box we'll have a few minutes to answer any questions. Um, I guess one yeah one final one for me is um, there's, gonna, there's people on this webinar, you know, that are from the, from the CPS and from the police. 
Um, what advice would you both give them, Doug and, Doug and Joyce? Um, I think definitely for me, the main thing is improved uh, communication. Um, I also think that there's clear uh, instructions in the victim's code and also legislation and guidelines. And I think the CPS, the police and their uh, agents um, should follow that because it's very important. Um, I think for cases not to be rushed uh, mm. so that the, the best evidence uh, can be provided. I think that uh, GBH charges should include cars and those cars should be confiscated like other weapons are, uh, whereas in our case, the man got his uh, car back. Um, I think that uh, all victims who are covered under special measures should meet with the, the barrister before, mm -hmm. uh, a week before uh, the case, uh, because it's very traumatic on the day just turning up and giving evidence. Um, I think that the police CPS, um, etc. need training on how to deal with victims properly, particularly those with PTSD and vulnerable victims. Um, I think that there needs to be sentencing guidelines for uh, causing serious injury by dangerous driving because uh, although the charge was introduced, I believe, in 2012, there's still not sentencing guidelines and this proved problematical for the judge uh, during sentencing. Uh, and I also think that the maximum sentence for causing serious injury by dangerous driving should be increased. And my final thing is that uh, whilst the uh, defendant's character um, put on as, uh, you know, listened to that the man was of good character, nothing was said about Craig uh, and I think that it's important that perhaps maybe for consideration to be given for the victim support personal statements to be read out to the jury so that they can actually understand the impact yeah. on the victim and also uh, family members. I don't know if you've got anything to add, Doug. Yeah, I would. Uh, it's, it's funny, just on that last point, I mean, th this is uh, the thing that shocked me most. When we arrived on sentencing day, um, Craig and Joyce had spent an enormous amount of time boiling down a year and a half's agony into a couple of sides of A4. Uh, and nothing, um, nothing measures the kind of um, the trauma that they've gone through, but they did it and it was there. And they get to court um, uh, to read uh, their um, victim's personal statements because at no point has the driver in this case shown any remorse uh, and so it's an opportunity, as the judge later remarked, it was the only opportunity for him to actually hear what he had done uh, to Craig and um, by impact his, his, his partner, Joyce. And when we got into the court, the barrister, it was like someone got a rump of the bailey, was flourishing their victim personal statements. And he actually said, and this is not a caricature, you don't actually want to read these, do you? <laughs> the judge will have read them, I can guarantee. Now, I mean, it had there not been three of us there who looked him in the eye and said, they've spent a lot of hours writing these statements after the terrible thing that happened to them, and yes, they are going to read them. But it, it, it was a really shocking thing. He was dissuading them from doing something that really did have some value. To stand there in that courtroom look at that driver that had done that to them and tell them, tell him what it was they'd done. So my recommendations for the CPS would be, you know, keep your eye on the ball, keep a witness and a victim are often the same person and you want them in CPS terms to be best witness. So yes, if you are going to introduce a very good lad from Middlesbrough to somebody who may well have been to a very good public school and been 50 years at the bar. It might be an idea if these two rather different worlds get more than two minutes before the court case in which to meet. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's really um, helpful. And I think that will be great value for um, the people from the CPS and the police that are on the call um, just now. And um, we've got a couple of questions. I'm, I'm not going to have, I don't think I'm going to have time to answer all of these questions, but I'm going to pick two of them. 
Um, so one, um, what accounts did the defendant give about his actions in this case? Um, Joyce, might I, I, I think one of the interesting observations here very quickly is that obviously he had had a lawyer working on his case, very well paid, and the guy did a good job. Uh, whereas, you know, Craig got, got a, a standard issue duty available CPS guy who, you know, has not worked on the case as long. He mm -hmm. he expressed no remorse, whatever. What he, his defense was, which the judge afterwards described as no defense at all. But but the, but this <laughs> in guidance to the jury it wasn't made clear. His defense was that his mind had gone blank which is not a defense in law. No. Um, and, and the judge made that very clear afterwards, as she did in sentencing when she looked uh, the driver in the eye and said, you used your car effectively as a weapon. I wrote it down in shorthand. It was the neon 78 point Baldini biggest thing in the case and it didn't matter. Right, thank you. Um, and then one, one, one final question to you then, um, and it's a really good one from Joe. Um, what part do you think CPS conviction rates play in getting cases um, involving dangerous or careless or, or, or downgrading cases essentially, I think is what she's asking. Well, I think we did touch on it and I think it's human, you know, and, and, and uh, Rad would recognize this, you know, people, People are uh, in organizations and institutions are constantly having their, their stats reviewed and they want mm -hmm. convictions. And, and there was a conviction in this case, the fact that it wasn't a commensurate conviction. And again, I'm entirely sympathetic with, with Rad's absolutely proper point. No amount of a heavy sentence will give Craig his ribs back will will give him his ability to walk back his ability not to be worried back none of those things you don't seek vengeance but you seek some measure that 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 what was done to you has been taken seriously by the system otherwise you feel as craig felt worthless and so i think that's the biggest lesson to, to you know to come out uh, of all of this that you will get the conviction that you want if you do your homework on the case and uh, and somebody who lived on the moon would have seen that this was minimum gbh with intent and 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 that water was muddied by needlessly conservatively with a small c adding uh, a charge that the jury went for for other complex reasons Great, thank you both um, so, so much for your time and thank you also to Craig who did the um, recording. Um, really appreciate it and I think it's highlighted a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of issues that apply to a lot of people even though it's unusual um, you know, to have a vehicle used as a weapon, that's not how most crashes happen. But thank you um, so much. I'm going to start um, sharing my screen again now. Okay, so the um, next section we've got now is um, a pre-record with Claire Waxman, who's the London Victim Commissioner. Um, and we, her and I discuss the Victim's Code and the Victim's Law. And I think, you know, after listening to um, Joyce and Doug just now, um, and Rad also, the, the Victim's Code is just such um, a big issue um, and is so important for all victims of crime, not just crash victims. So I will now play you the video. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's really um, very appreciated. Um, I just wanted to start off really, I, there are so many people that are killed and injured on the roads in, in London. Um, what have you found to be the biggest issues that's, that are facing crash victims? Okay, so um, since I, I became Victims Commissioner for London, I've engaged a lot with crash victims um, 
mainly by working with Road Peace, the organisation, they're part of my victims reference group, which was really set up for me to engage with those supporting victims to identify what any barriers, what the barriers and challenges were um, for those victims and survivors trying to access justice and support. And I think what's been really clear working with victims and with Road Peace um, is that many crash victims and their families do not feel that the system is working for them effectively. And more importantly, their support needs are not being recognized and met. So that's absolutely critical. Um, it's also about not recognizing secondary victims so not really understanding the families that have been impacted, the trauma and the bereavement that they're going through, and that they are victims too, and they should have a right to access um, timely information, communication and support. And as we know, that doesn't work as effectively as it should. Um, yeah, so it's really about clearly identifying those secondary victims as well as seeing them as, as victims um, and in order to better connect those families with the right type of support that they need to help them cope. I don't think they'll ever fully recover, but it's to help them to cope and to manage in their life. Thank you for that. Um, I think, yeah, that's definitely a, an aspect that, um, you know, we find that, that, that victims do not get enough support. Um, and I think that's been identified really particularly um, crash victims in particular, I think, tend to fall through the gaps, I yeah. think, that, because there's just so many as well as the other thing. Um, Absolutely. Um, and I, and it's, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, and it's also that lack of recognising their rights under the code, and so they're really not getting that level of support, uh, information, updates that they should be getting because they're just uh, omitted from that. Yeah. Mm. Um, and can you tell us a bit, because I, I think there'll be some people on the call that um, would like to know possibly more about what your role as the London's Victims Commissioner is. So that didn't exist before um, City yeah. Crown Company, did it? Yeah, it didn't. So we've had a National Victims Commissioner um, for some time, but I think Sadiq Khan recognised um, the importance of having a local, a localised Victims Commissioner, so one for London who would be independent, who would really champion the voices um, and interests of victims and survivors within London. Um, he knows full well how important um, accessing good support is and how important the justice system is to help victims cope and recover. So he really recognised that and felt that somebody needs to come into this role to really champion those voices and needs, which would help to uh, better inform statutory partners and agencies to provide better services and support through the criminal justice system. It's, Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the role was, it was, a, it was obviously, you know, victim, independent victims commissioner for London, but it, it wasn't defined as such. So I came into it having to really create the role. Um, and for me, it was about, as I said, working really closely with victims and survivors on the ground and the organisations that support them to help me identify what those barriers and challenges are because there are many for all victims when they're trying to access the justice process or trying to access support and so it's really about extracting from those lived experiences to help inform policy practice legislation and commissioning cool thank you thank you for that um, so we, Road Peace members, you know, we, we had a huge response to the, the Victims Code consultation recently and there's a, a, lot of, a lot of our members responded to it, which was great. Um, can you tell us a bit about um, the Victims Code for those that don't know what it is and also what you think needs to change with it? Okay, so the Victims Code um, was a, a very um, well-intentioned document um that uh, came in to help improve the support to victims and that they would get a minimum level of service when going through the justice system and so it outlines in a very lengthy hundred over 100 page document um, these different rights and entitlements that victims should get um, if they report or even if they don't report to the police and going through that justice process the issue that we have and that I've had with the Victims Code for many years is that it's it's toothless. So there's not nothing happens if that agency doesn't provide that right to that victim. Uh, they might get an apology letter, but that's about it. Um, many of the statutory partners um, that are in, are in that 
Victims Code that are, are supposed to be uh, delivering those entitlements often aren't aware um, what this, what their entitlements are, what the victims' entitlements are. They don't understand the code and therefore many of the agencies aren't complying with it. So when I first came into this role, I wanted to look at compliance with the code. I wanted to understand. I knew anecdotally, I was hearing from victims and survivors, that the code wasn't really making a difference to the type of service they were receiving. And in fact, it was being breached time and time again. I wanted to really understand you know, how to the extent of which that was happening. Uh, and no one had actually looked at compliance with the code at all. So I uh, did a year and a half long piece of research and study. We spoke to over 2,000 victims and survivors in London. Uh, we spoke to uh, practitioners, statutory partners, and we got the most comprehensive picture of why the code was failing and wasn't working. Um, and the government was had agreed already to reform the code. And so that huge body of evidence and research has been given to the government to help them uh, improve and reform the code. So hopefully what we have coming published, I believe, uh, late summer, early autumn, uh, mm -hmm. doesn't get delayed any further, is a far more um, comprehensive code which statutory partners will be able to understand, comply with and deliver and will provide hopefully a better uh, experience and service to victims. So there will now be 12 overarching uh, rights and entitlements. So um, it's been simplified into 12 overarching rights. So it should be um, a more workable um, code really, so that those on the ground will know what their rights are, because many victims had never even heard of the Victims Code. They didn't know they had rights and entitlements. And so they can't really push for a better service if they don't know what they should be getting. So it's to help victims and to help practitioners as well. Great, thank you. Thank you for that explanation. That's um, really good. And the other thing as well is there's the Victims Code, but also there's been a lot of talk about the Victims Law. Um, what, would that, what would that mean? So, as I said, the code is, has been toothless um, and it doesn't go far enough in, 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 in some ways. So, for example, um, a victim's law would, I believe, help to improve the current complaint system, for example. So, at the moment, if you don't, as a victim, if you don't receive an entitlement under the victim's code, um, you would potentially complain to that statutory partner, they would send you back some response. What many victims don't know is they then have a right to go to their MP. Um, they'd have to then re-explain and retell their experience again, explain what the breaches of the code were, hope that that MP understands what the victim's code is and what their responsibility is within the code. And then that MP would have to take it to the parliamentary and health ombudsman who would then investigate the breach. That doesn't happen at the moment because victims don't know about it and it's not being pushed. So really, I have been asking for years to get rid of this MP filter and so that victims can go directly to an ombudsman or somebody who can come in and investigate the breach of code, the breaches of code. So we'd need primary legislation in order to make that change. So a victim's law would help with that, for example. But the victim's law would give victims legally enforceable rights and I believe would create a culture shift that we really need so that those statutory partners ensure that victims are actually at the heart of the criminal justice system. At the moment it's it's optional. It's almost like a tick box exercise with the code um, and that's why we see so many issues with the type of service that victims are getting. If we had a victim's law, statutory partners would know that they would have to ensure that those victims got the right, uh, got their right to support and got their right to information, for example, um, and would help to create a, a far better service because it's about, as I said, pushing this cultural shift to understand, it's not about tick boxing, it's about victims need rights, you know, need access to good quality support, they need timely updates, they need to be informed in a sensitive and trauma-informed way. Um, and, you know, in order for, for victims and survivors to stay engaged in what is often an incredibly complex um, process and a re-traumatising process for many. So I think the Victims Law would help to achieve that, to help to push for this trauma-informed service that I've been asking for for years, which is what I think every victim and survivor 
should be entitled to if we want them to stay engaged in a very complex justice process. It will help to improve justice outcomes and also recovery outcomes as well. Great, thank you. And I, I think I'm right in saying that the victim's law got cross-party support, didn't it, before the election. Um, do you have any sense as to you know, when, when it might come in, like what, what the barriers are? <laughs> okay, so I have personally been campaigning for a victim's law since 2013. And so through the campaigning that I did before I was victim's commissioner, um, we, we got cross-party support on a victim's bill that I drafted um, along with Keir Starmer. And um, that's how we got the uh, agreement from government back in 2016 that they would reform the code within 12 months, which didn't happen, and they would bring in primary legislation of a victim's law. So it was all supposed to be brought in by 2017, but of course we had a number of snap elections and Brexit, and now we've had COVID, so it's sort of being pushed and delayed mm -hmm. over time. Having said that, we have had repeatedly firm commitment from the government saying as soon as the code is published, they will start consultation on the victim's law. So Great. I feel like we are, we're nearly there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll believe it when I see it, but I think yeah. we're nearly there. And I think the victim's law gives us all a really good opportunity to put in for things that we ha maybe couldn't get within the code that is still required in order to strengthen victims' rights. Great, so. thank you. I think that's really that's really good to hear, and thank you for all of your work pushing for that. Um, so on the on the webinar today, we've heard um, from families who are fighting the justice system, and there'll be a lot of people listening who are who are going through the same thing. Um, can you give us kind of any advice on how to approach injustice in the in, in the system? General question, but <laughs> no, no, that I can. Yeah. So um, for many, they might not know my history. So I was a victim of stalking for many years. Um, for well over a decade. So I understand, although it was a different crime, firsthand the failings of the criminal justice system and how re-traumatizing that complex process is. Um, for me, it, and for, which I think will resonate with many of your families, it was really important to try and take back some control. And in order to help my cope and recovery, I felt I needed to be part of the change. I needed to do something. I needed to use that lived experience to make change. It was absolutely vital for me. I di we didn't really have, Twitter wasn't what it is now. We didn't really have those social media platforms. So what I did at the beginning, and I think it's still a useful thing, is I reached out to NPs. So I would uh, look on Hansard debates and look at who might have an interest in the issues that I was trying to push um, and contact those MPs. I also contacted people and organisations who were working on similar issues to me and to try and have meetings with them, share my lived experience and talk about how can we work together to campaign and make changes. Um, we looked at petitions, we looked at using the media, so talking to journalists, which I know can be quite a difficult process as well, but they do have their use if they can, you know, if you have some control over how your story will be told and if you can articulate the sort of changes that you want to see as well. Um, but now we have social media and I think Twitter is an amazing vehicle for, for campaigning um, and for getting those lived experiences out to, to more people. So I think it's about looking at the right type of MPs, even your local MP or other MPs to work with organisations and people that are campaigning on similar issues, using those social media avenues as well, um, create a Twitter account and, and really engage with those other organisation and MPs on, on Twitter. Um, and petitions, online petitions are great. And, and also any consultations that are happening, look out for what's happening. Government have been doing one consultation after the other at the moment. There's ways in which you can feed in your experiences, even if it's not just around yes my experience as a uh, as a family maybe as a, from a road crash uh, experience but also experience of that criminal justice process so there are ways to extract from that experience and feed into the government as well um, and there are people to contact if you're in london like myself i will always support any victim survivor who wants to campaign i will help them with that almost devise an action plan for them because i know how important it is to hear those lived experiences and for that victim and family to have that 
uh, campaign process, which is so important in the COVID recovery journey, as you know, you know, it really, it really does play a part for some, not for everyone, but for some. So, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, I, I, I urge people if they can to share their experiences if they're able as much as possible. I know how I've used it in my work. I, you know, all my work is very much centered around that victim's voice and experience. You know, people say to me, well, you, why do you meet so many victims on a rate, you know, on an almost daily basis when you're working with the statutory partners and the organizations that support them? Because for me, l listening to every individual victim that I meet shines a different light, a light on a different part of the process that isn't working. So everyone's lived experience is really invaluable to helping us create the changes that we need. Great, Claire, thank you so much. I think um, that's everything I wanted to ask you. Um, because obviously it's pre-recorded, so um, you won't be able to answer questions on the on the day. Um, but if, I guess if anyone's got um, any questions for Claire, they can always um, email me and I can forward, forward them on yeah, to you. Yeah, I'm very yeah. happy if you want to, as I say, put out my Twitter account or the... Thank you so much for joining Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think that was a very useful chat um, with Claire Waxman there. Um, I'm not doing especially well on time, so it's already 17 minutes past four, and um, this is meant to be finishing at 4.30. Um, but our final session is um, with Kira Lee, um, whose husband Eddie was killed, and um, we're going to be talking about Theresa May's new bill and the maximum life sentence for death by dangerous driving and the impact that will have on families. Um, I'm going to start off by showing you a quick video. I promise it's going to be quicker than the one I just showed you just now. Oh dear, technical glitch. Um, one moment, I will just start screen sharing again. Okay. This was Eddie Lee playing in the garden. Oh, sorry, I've just heard that um, no one can see anything um, whilst I'm playing this video. Um, uh, do you know what I'm going to do is I'm not going to continue playing the video and um, what we will do instead is speak to Kira about her experience and her thoughts. Um, hi Kira, if you wouldn't mind, um, yeah, you've unmuted yourself, that's good. Uh, thank you so much for um, joining us today, that's really, really fantastic. Um, you're one of Theresa May's constituents. Um, can, can you do mind talking a bit about, about what happened, about your experience and what happened to you? Yeah, sure. Um, um, we, live, uh, we live near Maidenhead, near a village called Cookham. We live on the river. Um, and my husband, he commuted to work just one day a week. He worked from home uh, four days a week. And he um, was traveling on the M4 and he slowed, he was traveling on a um, commuter motorbike and he slowed uh, to queuing traffic. He was waiting behind queuing traffic because he was a very uh, safe rider. He was a phenomenal cyclist um, and he waited behind the cars. He didn't filter through and he was hit at speed by a man in a van and the van driver, um, he it was all caught on CT, uh, CCTV um, by a, another van that was traveling in a different lane. 
Um, and initially he um, sort of lied and said he didn't see Eddie or something like that. Um, but it transpired that he knew the people in the van traveling in the lane next to him. And there was some form of communication um, game going on between the two vans. Uh, so he, he didn't see my husband for at least 16 seconds. Well, in fact, he never saw my husband until he was lying on the ground um, in a scene that was described as something like a, a bomb blast. Um, it was, yeah, utter carnage. Um, Eddie was taken to hospital. He was, um, he had severe brain damage. Um, he was pronounced brain dead around eight days later. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's, that's where, where, you know, our, our lives as we knew it came to an end. My two year old lost his dad. He lost his, um, his first language because Eddie spoke Chinese to him. Um, and he was at home so much that our son took to that language first. And yeah, our, our perfect little life was, um, you know, smashed to pieces on the M4. Mm. Yeah, I'm so sorry. It's it's just it's awful um, what happened to you. I am really so sorry. Um, and in terms of the 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 the, the, the sentencing and, and the and the courts process, can you talk, tell me a bit about that and what happened there? Yeah, I, I had a um, I had a very positive positive experience like you with the police and with the CPS. Um, I was assigned a, a police team uh, early on, an excellent FLO who. Uh, I was very concerned at the beginning, and I, I, actually everyone's mentioned this so far, um, the word fight, uh, because I knew from the beginning, sat by Eddie's bedside, that there was going to be a fight on my hands. Um, we knew uh, very early on he was at no fault. And I think when you love someone so much, you vow to fight for them. And um, I was very keen early on to know that I had a police team that were going to fight for my husband and that they were going to secure the most appropriate charge, which was death by dangerous driving, and that they weren't going to try and go with death by careless driving. Um, so I felt like that was my first fight. Mm. Uh, we secured that charge about three months later. And then uh, I was fortunate, in one sense of the word, that the driver pled guilty straight away once he'd seen the, the footage, um, the CCTV. Um, and then it was a case of waiting for sentencing, but I knew I, I knew, I'm a journalist um, and I know enough about the law and about road, uh, road crimes to know that the sentences are terrible. So I was um, gearing up for that to be my next fight. And I had an inkling very early on that that was going to be what I was going to need to fight about because I started writing my um, victim impact statement while Eddie was still on a life support machine. Um, I was determined that the uh, the driver and the judge were going to experience as close as possible to what I was going through. Um, I wrote down smells, noises, sounds, things said, people said to me, things my son said to me, um, the darkest thoughts that went through my head, every description I could find of, of my tanned athletic husband as a corpse in a coffin. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted them to experience it because I thought if he's going to get a terrible sentence a really pathetic sentence i want to do everything in my power to try and push that judge into giving him something that's more realistic for the crime he's committed um but life isn't like an episode of suits and it doesn't mm. work like that and while i gave a, an impassioned speech in court and i spoke for 40 minutes and i you know i addressed him directly and i did make an impact on him as a person it wasn't enough to do anything for the sentencing because it was going against the beginning. Um, he pled guilty, so that's automatically third off the sentence. Um, he stopped at the scene, so that is taken into account as some kind of good deed. He attempted mm. some CPR, which I'm not sure why that's um, rewarded, but it was taken into account. Um, and eventually the judge was only able to give him 22 months, um, of which he served, he was to serve 11 months inside and the rest on uh, license but the um, really difficult thing then I then had to fight for was that if you if you're given a sentence that's less than a year you are then um, often put forward for the automatic release scheme 
So just a few months into his um, sentence, I had a visit from a prison liaison officer who informed me that he was going to be released after six months, which is when I then, having felt sort of so strong in what I was doing and, you know, being left raising a two-year-old on my own and missing the person I was wanting to spend my life with, I thought, right, I've got another fight on my hands when I just wanted to try and repeat, you know, repiece my life or some form of life back together for us, um, which is when I contacted Theresa May. Um, she was really good um, in that she listened to my concerns. She took them to the um, Justice Ministry, uh, but she wasn't able to help with the sentence. So I thought, I'm not going to leave it there. So luckily I had written quite a strong letter to Theresa May and I threatened to um, release the CCTV to the press. Um, and I'd, you know, I'd threatened to kick up as much of a stink as I could. Um, and the liaison officer that had visited me from the prison service uh, felt the letter was strong enough to take directly to the prison. She, she actually physically took it to the prison uh, and gave it to the prison governor and he, he stopped the early release. But all of that, you know, and then he was released after his 11 months anyway. Um, so yeah, yeah that's where it's, we're a, at. it's a battle to have to do that. And like you're saying, it's kind of when you're having to fight the system like that, you're not able to then try and get, get on with your life as best as best you can. I think that's um, really difficult. Um, so I could so say, yeah, so with Theresa May's new bill, so that will mean that um, the maximum sentence is currently 14 years for death by dangerous driving. The maximum sentence will be life in prison. Um, I mean, how, how, how would that have affected your case, do you think? I think the judge wanted to give more. I don't believe the driver should have gone to prison for life necessarily, um, but he did need to serve a significant amount of time inside for me to be able to say to my son when he asks, and he asks regularly about the man that went to prison, that he served a punishment that was, you know, a decent amount of time for what he's done to our lives. And I think it will just give judges that ability to, to give longer um, rather than be starting at 14 years and working down um, as, as the, the case is presented to them by the defence lawyers. Um, and I think, you know, the, ju the judge in my case, he apologised and I was expecting that as well. I know, I, I sort of thought, that I know how this is going to go and the police team knew how it was going to go. But we, we knew it would be bad, but we didn't know it would be that bad. Um, and he would have been able to give longer if there had been a wider scope for this crime. But I think something that you and I have talked about before is that with road crime, uh, it's just got this kind of unsexy vibe to it. And I often mm -hmm. say my husband was remarkable and he was killed in the most unremarkable way. He was killed in a in a cliche that we hear on a traffic report on local radio. And I think that's reflected in every element of the justice system, sometimes down to how, how a police team might treat it or how, uh, you know, the lawyers that then represent people in these cases, it's just not the cool part of the law. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I often think it's really sad that sometimes my case gets more media attention because Eddie was photogenic and we had a very cute child and people are willing to put that photo on the news or in a paper but for mm. other families it just kind of gets forgotten in this cliche of a 74 four year old man was knocked down and killed you know and and then so then it's like knock on the punishments don't ever reflect it because you're unable to fully paint that picture of how horrific a road death is or a road injury and it's utterly utterly horrific. Yeah, I, t I totally agree. I think it's just a sheer number and the fact that it doesn't get the attention that it needs. Um, you know, even in, in the media as well, it very rarely gets the attention that it needs. Um, I will encourage, if there's anyone um, who would like to ask Kira a question, um, please do type it into the chat box. I don't think we've had any in for this session yet, um, but please do type in if you'd like to ask Kira a question. Um, I think I've just got one, one final one and, and you've touched on it already, I think. Um, but, I, you know, some people will say no driver ever gets 14 years anyway for death by dangerous driving. So what's the point in making it life in prison? 
Well, it will in it will increase it. That's I mean, if your if your starting point as a judge is fourteen years, then then you're never going to really be able to give the fourteen years only in real exceptional cases. But if the maximum is life, then you are you are going to have that ability to give longer. And you know, it's not about that driver going in and and having to reform as a character, but it is about sending a message to other drivers and to to, to people that are still using their mobile phones on the road or they're still you know driving like idiots it's it sends a more powerful message rather than just a slap on the wrist because that's that's really how a, an 11 month sentence feels when someone so amazing was killed and you know and my, you know I, I sometimes think you know the best sentence the driver could really get for me would be I would ask him to come to my house every night and read my son a story and then as he falls asleep wait for the questions because that's when they come the questions about how is daddy lying on the road were daddy's eyes open did daddy cry when he died well where's his body now you know and that's not a realistic punishment and in the absence of being able to give a punishment like that we need to give something that's more significant mm. and longer longer prison sentences would would do that mm. um thank you thank you for that Kira. Um, so I've got um, one, one question has come in. Um, it says, my eldest daughter was killed on the road as a pedestrian. Do you think poor driving standards and risky driving has become socially acceptable? Yeah, I think it has. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, that's something that I, I now find very hard because I know a lot of people that are close to me and who are close to Eddie. Um, they will call out bad driving when they see it. You know, they will if they see someone on their phone while they're driving, they will they will address it and tackle it head on. I personally find that very hard to do because I'm so close to it. But yes, it has become acceptable. And you know, to people that have been affected in this way, it kind of blows our brains that it is become part of daily life. And and often you'll see TV shows where you know it, even the driving's not very good or certain elements of it are, are funny and it, mm. it completely needs addressing but i would like to say something positive that i am seeing um is and i know you've been working really closely with them is the met police and the attitude attitudes they're mm. now taking to bad driving and this kind of zero tolerance of it and their, their vision zero um, concept that they've been working on. And they are now starting to really call it out and they're using, they're using social media platforms really well to do it. So I do, I do think, I sometimes think, oh, I could drown in all of this, but then I look at the positive changes that are happening. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we do need to focus on those because you know we can't have pedestrians being knocked down and killed. It's not okay. I want my son to be able to walk to school and, and ride his bike on a road and you know and not have to face the risks that his dad had to face yeah thank you yeah i think um I, yeah, i'm also very encouraged with what i've seen um in london and there's other parts of the country as well that um you know have been really tackling and, and seeing seeing like road danger and road crime as a big problem but that's not the case everywhere i don't think without there are there are areas where um they've seen some positive positive changes um, we've got a question from Jo, um, she's asking, where do you get your strength from to keep going with your fight? Have you been able to give yourself time to grieve? I don't know, I sometimes wonder this, where it's coming from. I think, um, oh, just like, I was married to a really amazing person mm. and, and Rad said something similar about Harry's mum standing over him and vowing to fight and I did the same because and like, this is a really traumatic thing for people to hear, and I'm sorry if it upsets anyone, but I looked at my husband in a, a funeral home in the, you know, it was the hottest summer of our lives, and our son was at home in, in a paddling pool, and him, he was a corpse, and he was still a muscular, beautiful human, but he didn't look at peace. And I took that image, as horrendous as it was, and I thought, right, I'll fight for you. And I said out loud, I'll fight for you. I'll keep fighting, 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 because I felt like he was too important to lose and I want the world to know about it. And I'll just keep fighting. And sometimes I think, well, I'm probably fighting for my son as well. I'm not just fighting for his dad because they're, they're part and parcel of the same thing. I mean, they, they're so the same anyway. Um, 
and I, I am able to keep on living. I still laugh and I'm still a happy person, but I will always have to fight because I think the people that we've lost on the road, you know, the likes of Harry, the likes of Eddie, um, you know, the people that have been injured like Craig, they're too important just to be forgotten in this kind of cliche. And it, it's not enough that we just like let, let them let them be and disappear mm -hmm. off into, you know, memories, happy memories of the past. It's, it's, you know, the fight is probably, yeah, just to keep going and keep them, you know, not, not just remembered, but make, make positive change to happen, to stop it happening again. You're amazing. Thank you so much um, for this. I've got one question, one more question, but this is to go to all of the panelists. Um, so please unmute yourselves, the ones that are muted, Rad and, and Joyce. Um, yeah, this is a question for everyone, but if road crashes are so often not treated as crimes when a crime has been committed and the punishment does not fit the crime, how are we going to deter dangerous driving? The broad question. <laughs> well, I go, shall I go first? Yes, um, you go first, Red. Look, every one of these tragedies, and I'm sitting here with tears in my eyes listening to yeah. every one of these stories, it's absolutely heartbreaking. You know, we have to, we, as a society, we have to decide what sort of country we want to live in. And I am appalled by the carnage on the roads. You know, every loss of life or serious injury is one too many. We have to decide what we want. Um, these are weapons that people are driving around. And my, my son is just learning to drive. He's just turned 17. And I've sat down and told him that, you know, if he does, you know, if, he, if, he, if he's involved in bad driving, there's a potential to go to jail. I, I think we have to look at these as crimes. It's the only way forward. And I am not having anybody saying that it is socially acceptable to, to drive badly. So we have to put it back to our lawmakers when we vote them in to say enough is enough. And we've had incredible people on this, on this call today, and I admire them immensely. Um, we have to listen to what they're saying. Um, and we have to put a stop to it. So let's let's get those uh, sentences increased, but let's improve training, let's improve infrastructure. It's a complex issue, but and you guys at Road Peace are right at the forefront of it. And I'm uh, you know, proud to be associated with you. Well, thank you, Rad. Did anyone else, any other panelists like to uh, answer the question? I think there's a straight line between um, consequences uh, and, and events. And um, there is a long history of, uh, of, of, of crimes being uh, less frequently committed when people know what the consequences are. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not a judge putting on a black cap for any of this. Anybody <laughs> who's spoken about their experiences today knows that the punishment should fit the crime, um, at, but, but it doesn't there's no great redemptive thing in it it's just you don't want to feel worthless on top and so i think the kind of cases that we've heard about deserve to be publicized as you know as as terrible exemplars of what happens when people are, are either deliberately dumb on the roads or or simply are negligent to the point of culpability and I think publicity for what happens in people's uh, lives is is a, is a big big part of that people have to know what they cause thanks Doug Joyce and Kira do you want to do you want to answer the, the question as well um I I think that um it's absolutely ridiculous that a uh, causing serious injury by dangerous driving doesn't have um, any sentencing guidelines. So I think for me, one of the, you know, you do have to keep on fighting. You don't know where you actually get the strength from. But I also believe that if perhaps maybe we keep on fighting for that, then that will be good because then it means that you're going to get consistencies in sentencing rather than uh, differentiations. Um, I also th think as well, uh, I liked what the commissioner said about uh, making sure that um, we monitor the victim code mm. uh, because all we got was, oh, sorry, we didn't do it. We hope you're okay in your recovery. Well, you know, with a metal pelvis, metal ribs, I could go on and list a huge big injury. Well, a sorry is not good enough. 
um, you, you should be doing um, a lot better. Uh, and, and it's not acceptable. So I, unfortunately, there's still a long way to go, uh, but I know that Craig and I are committed to keeping on going uh, because we think what happened to us is not acceptable and we don't want other families to have to experience the poor service that we received. Mm. Thank you, Joyce. And Kira, any, any final comments, any final comment from you? No, I, mean, I think they've pretty much covered it all. Yeah. But yeah, I would just say, you know, that in all of these cases, it's um, remembering who the victim is. And I think that's, that's what gets lost. And that's, that's when the injustice starts to kick in. So I think, you know, everyone that's spoken today is a really amazing example of fighting to stop that happening. Everyone, thank you so much. Joyce, Rad, Doug and Kira, thank you so much for um, joining us today. This has just been the most amazing session and I think everyone on the call, I think is much more informed now about the issues and, and, and what needs to be done about it. Um, so thank you so much for your time. I really, really do appreciate it. We weren't able to get through um, all of the questions. So I will make a note of all of them and possibly send them around to you um, later on if there's additional ones that need answering. Um, and just to say to everyone um, that's attended the webinar, you know, if you want to get involved in campaigning on certain issues or if any of this has, you know, thrown up any trauma or anything like that, please do get in touch with Road Peace and you can contact info at roadpeace.org. Um, but yes, thank you. Thank you again, everyone. I think um, really fantastic. I really appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Bye, everyone. Yeah, great. Thank you. Take Bye. Care, Thank you. Bye.